to tell you about. I drawn an excellent write-up from Polio Community College about her life. Esmeralda grew up in Toja Baja, Puerto Rico. She came into the United States at the age of 13. Esmeralda didn't know as much English. She learned the language from reading children's books in a Brooklyn library. Esmeralda was encouraged to audition for Performing Arts High School, where she majored in drama and dance. After eight years of part-time study at community colleges, Esmeralda transferred to Harvard University with a full scholarship and graduated magna cum laude in 1976. Shortly after graduation, her, she and her husband, Frank Cantor, founded Cantor Media and Film Media Production Company, which has won many awards. Her second memoir, Almost a Woman, received an Alex Award from the American Library Association and was made into a P.O. Body award-winning movie for PBS Masterpiece Theater's American Collection. Esmeralda is the only living author in this collection. Esmeralda earned a Master of Fine Arts in Fiction, writing from Sierra Lawrence College and honorary degrees from many colleges, including the University of Puerto Rico. She's a spokesperson on behalf of public libraries, has designed and developed community programs for teenagers at risk, and was founder of Dove and a regional shelter for battered women and their children. She is passionate and about the need to encourage and support the artistic development of young people with storytelling and media literacy. At the Care Center, we are reading the novel America's Dreams by Esmeralda Santiago, which is so inspiring to us young mothers. After each chapter, we discuss and reflect on what we have read, and we see it as a flashback, how we were 14 at one time, and we were rebellious, how some of us ran away with our boyfriends, how some of, some of us got pregnant at the same age as well. This novel really speaks to us because we do shut out the most important people in our lives. And we feel like we have to run away to get the freedom. This novel is not only a book to the Care Center girls, it's a comparison to our own lives. As a writer and a person, as Marla is our sample and role model, she didn't di get discouraged. She kept following her dreams, her fiction, and her, whole li her own life story reminds us to not let our past keep us from going where we want to go in life, no matter how much we get put down. We should be proud of who we are and share our stories so that others can learn from them. And Esmeralda is loved by so many people. In fact, her number one fan is in the audience, Anna Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> she might have some competition from the rest of us here at the Care Center, but maybe we can give it up for the amazing, wonderful Esmeralda Santana. <laughs> Thank you very much. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. So nice to be here with you. This is my third time with a group from uh, this organization. And gracias por invitarme. Uh, pero yo he estado en la casita. Nunca en la biblioteca. I'm so happy to be in a library because libraries are very important in my life. Uh, life, uh, my life. Is this thing on, by the way? This mic? Do we need it? OK, OK, sorry. <laughs> so I can speak louder. <laughs> um, the uh, a library is an important place for me because when I first came to Brooklyn from Puerto Rico, uh, I, one of my classmates introduced me to the library. And it was where I learned English because there was, there was no bilingual education when I came. I know I'm old, you guys, so. <laughs> but it was, there was no bilingual education. Basically, their whole concept was you just go into school and you'll figure it out. Yes. And so um, I kind of tried to do that and uh, the way I did it was by going to the children's department and getting illustrated books and then, then uh, you know, a little chapter book and then eventually I got to read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, trying to find the tree. Um, but it was, really, um, it was really a journey of many, many years for me to feel um, that I am a Puerto Rican woman in the United States. And that sounds so simple, right? Like, you know, yo soy quien soy. Pero the, the, the reality for those of us who come from other places or who have two languages in our lives, in our families, uh, different cultures, the reality is that our cultures and the society that surrounds us at home is really different from the one that's outside the doors of our apartments or our homes. And that was my big challenge because I grew up in rural Puerto Rico 
where um, si estaba lloviendo, yo me metía donde una vecina. I didn't have to ask anybody, you know, can I come in? It's raining. They knew it was raining, <laughs> and I didn't want to get wet, so I could just, you know, everybody, everybody was was part of this community. When we come to New York, you know, the first thing that I noticed is that there were like three locks on the door, and that to go to get out. I had to open three locks, and that if I wanted to go into somebody's home, they were, you know, they looked through the little peephole or the little chain, and so there was this sense of, of danger, even if nothing was happening to you, you felt like something terrible was going to happen. Um, and so my first few years was years of trying to get over the fear of being in the place where I was, which I could not leave. Mi mamá no quería regresar a Puerto Rico y no me quería enviar a Puerto Rico sola. So I had to stay there. You can't go by yourself there, and I'm not going back until I make the big move, right? So, so those, those years for me were years of trying to learn how to live in the city, because I grew up in, in un barrio, en, en el campo. I had to learn a language, which I only knew pollito chicken, uh, <laughs> um, I had to learn how to how to I had to, I had to learn climate because you know we had hurricanes but we, we had no snow and blizzards. I had to learn a different way of behaving because in los Estados Unidos, girls my age behave very differently, and I was una nena puertorriqueña decente back at home, but when I left to school, I would roll up my skirt so that would be sure. I'd put on makeup, <laughs> and then before home, I'd have to like, change it again. Because I, I was jumping into a world. It was like, you know, I was like doing this, you know. It, it was like constantly a double dutch uh, situation for me. Uh, a situation that, that I had to maintain in order to feel myself safe, because I, it was very clear to me that it was up to me. I'm the eldest of 11 children of a single mother. And my mother was overwhelmed. So if I had a question about anything, there were not too many answers because she was going through the same experience, you know, but, but for her age, you know. So um, it, was, it was not a place. She, she was not a place for me to get the information that I needed. And so I had to get it outside. And so I fortunately was able to find teachers who kind of guided me in, in a direction where I didn't know that I <coughs> needed to go until I was kind of in that path. Uh, and one of the things that, that became very clear to me, because this is what mommy would tell us, is that we came to the United States so that you all could have an education so that you would not have to work in a sweatshop like I do. That was her, that was her, that's all she kept every day. This is what we heard. I don't want you to end up like me, where I go to a, a factory, work every day, 10, 12 hours. On Friday, when you go on payday, they've closed it, and nobody gets paid, because that's the way they did it in those days. And so, so she wanted us to do better things with our lives than what she was able to do with her, because she didn't have the resources or the possibilities that, that we did. And some of us followed through with that. <laughs> some of us didn't. Three of my sisters were pregnant by the time they were 16, so that they have children that, you know, and my mother, by the time my mother passed away a year and a half ago, she had something like 17 great-grandchildren because that situation was repeated through the generations. That we're all a close family scattered all over the, actually all over the world at this point because some of my nephews and nieces are in the service and some of my brothers also travel a lot for their work. So, um, so even though they're close, they know that this, this even though my mother's dream was that this would be, it, it's going to take a while for all of us to catch up to her big dream. Um, 
not to depress you or anything. <laughs> but, but these things take time. And it, take time, it takes time, a lot of dedication. And it requires your sense of who you are. ¿Quién soy yo? Yo soy Esmeralda Santiago. ¿Qué quiere decir eso? Es un nombre. But there's a person behind that name. And when we look at ourselves, very often who we, who we think we are is not who other people see or when they hear they name, your name, that's not who they're imagining. They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about a, an abstract concept. So you can't depend on your sense of self coming from other people. It's, a har it's harder work when you do it from you than you can do it from somebody else. If somebody tells you to do or tries to te, te convence, te convence o, o te seducen, whatever, when somebody else is call, calling the shots in your life, they're not seeing you. They're seeing their, their plans or their desires or their expectations. So one of our jobs is to try and understand who am I? And how do we do that? Eso no es fácil, porque cuando uno tiene 14 años, you don't know who you are when you're 14. I sure didn't know. I knew who I wasn't. <laughs> and who I wasn't kept me going because I didn't want to become the, the stereotype. You know, I was not, I did not want to be the hot tomato Puerto Rican girl. You know, because that's what people were seeing in me. That's what they saw. And I, and I could see it porque me lo decían, o porque se comportaban de esa manera, you know. So I, I knew what was going on. So my first decision was, I am not going to become that stereotype that they see in their heads. I am going to completely change their vision of what a Puerto Rican poor, welfare, single mother, Older of 11, oldest of 11 children girl. I made that decision. That was not somebody told me. You know, it was, it just, I, I made the decision. And when you make a decision about your life, of course, then you have the responsibility of going through with your decision. <laughs> yes, or no difícil. <laughs> because making a decision about who you become, who you want to become is easy. Becoming that person is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Sometimes it means you leave people behind that you love. Your parents sometimes. Your boyfriend or girlfriend sometimes. In some situations, in the situations of, in my family, my, my grandmother had to leave her children. Sometimes you have to do that. But why are you doing it? When you make these kinds of big decisions, they have to come from your intention, not the intention of somebody else. For those of you who are young mothers, that means that you're making decisions not just for you, but another being coming into this universe that you will have to teach that lesson to. So you better start thinking about it and start learning it. And if you need help, look for mentors who can help you with that. I didn't have it at home. My mother couldn't help me. She couldn't. You know, she had 10 other kids. And I had too many questions for her. And she, wanted, and she was the kind of person that she wanted to be right all the time. So when I would ask her something, and she didn't have the answer, she would make something up, <laughs> and I had to be smart enough to say, I don't think so, mommy. I mean, como que no me suena. And then I had to make a decision based on my, you know, what I understood and what I saw around me. So you have, so when you're creating yourself, it, that's what you have to do all the time. You're, it, 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 it's a kind of selfishness. It's a kind of greediness for your own self. You have to value it. You have to recognize it. Then you have to value it. And thirdly, you have to protect it. And especially if you have children, you have to protect them so that they can go through that process with your help. All the work that you've done.
to do that. Um, so I always like this to be a dialogue and not a monologue. I could talk to you for hours. But I know that there are some questions. And so I mean, I keep talking until somebody tells me that you have a question. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my books and how I became a writer. I never, I never was like the kid who was always dreaming that she was going to be a writer. That was not me. I was a reader. I, I would read you know, the cereal boxes and uh, salsa de tomate cans and, and sardinas, I mean, every ingredient. I was just like, I loved to read anything that came uh, in front of me. And, um, and I really began to write, I be began to write when I realized that my story, the story that we've been seeing in this lovely exhibit, when I realized that my story could only be told by me, that my story was important, that my story would not be passed on to my children unless I told that story. I didn't want some, I certainly didn't want my mother to tell my story <laughs> because she has completely different versions of my life from you know, what I have, as you know, I'm sure you, you all do. Um, so so, so um, it, it, it was this desire to um, pass on my story to my children that made me start writing. Um, and I didn't write because I was going to publish it or anything like that. I wanted to do it for them because I wanted to make sure that they had, they had my version. Um, so when you, if, if any of you have a desire to write, remember you don't have to write for publication. <laughs> you can write for writing just so that you can have it. Whenever I get really upset, I could, you know, I could spend a lot of money going to a psychologist but actually, it's very cheap to buy a $15 uh, journal and then write everything in it. <laughs> and then, and I'm, a, I'm a person of lists. I make lists of what's going on so that I can go back and see, is that, you know, am I still dealing with this stuff? Not to say another word. Am I still dealing with this? You know, I need to do something about this. If you are constantly doing the same thing over and over again, you have to look at that and realize, if it's not working, you got to change the method. And so that's how I used my writing for many, many years, was so that I could talk to myself, and then so that I could have a record of those conversations. Um, are there any questions before I? Yes, ma'am. Um, did you know that when you were writing your book, did, did you think that it was going to impact a lot of people that were reading your book? No, I, you know, when I started writing, when I started writing books, I wrote, I, I started with the same idea, is that I had a story to tell. Uh, with America's Dream, it's a very interesting um, process for me because I was working, um, I was living in the suburbs of Boston and I, I was sure I was the only Puerto Rican like for miles around. <laughs> I was probably the, the, the only one with any pigment on her skin. I, I just really, stood out in this community. This was in Ingham in the, in the early 80s. And so, so, I, so I felt really like I, I'm here. I belong here because you know my husband and I bought a house and we were paying it, so, so we belong there. But I didn't feel a part of that community. And why was it? Because every time I went somewhere to the post office or to the butcher or somewhere, People are constantly asking me, where are you from? Now, when people ask you the first time, and it's kind of interesting to them, it, it, I'm happy to tell them because I'm very proud of where I came from. When the same person keeps asking me this, I, that question, you know what they're saying is, you don't belong here. And that's when I start. When you, and so I, I begin to write really from that kind of rage. And um, the next thing that happens, I have a little kid. I go to the, um, the playground. At the playground, the other Latinas think that I am a nanny, that I'm not, you know, oh, usted, usted es su hijo. <laughs> they thought I was, I was one of the, the nannies because the, the, the other mothers were working and so, but my son looks like me, you know, so they, they figured it out eventually. But then I realized there's a whole, there's a whole community of Latinas in this town that I had never seen. 
until I went to the playground. They were like inside the houses, taking other people's children, cooking, cleaning, all the things that they needed to do. And they're, who are they talking to? They could only talk to each other. Um, and so I started talking to them and they started talking to me. And coincidentally, I was working with this uh, shelter in Quincy um, that was really doing everything possible um, to, to, to um, I don't want to use a violent word, but it was, you know, to, to, to fight domestic <laughs> violence. And so we were doing, you know, we had a shelter, we took care of, of many women and children and did everything that we could to help them in that situation in whatever way would be the most helpful to them given their, the, what was going on. And so I was working with them and I was meeting these, these uh, amazing women to me who had a lot to say about their lives, but nobody, nobody talked to them about it. Nobody asked them. And so America's Dream, every single story that happened to America happened to one of those women. You know, they all told, they told me their stories because I was not judging them. I was really curious. I wanted to know. Sí, señora. So they were Señorita. Based on true stories. Perdón. <laughs> so they were based on true stories? Yeah, all those stories happened to somebody. I changed all the names, of course, and the way they look, because I didn't, you know, I, I didn't want them to feel embarrassed or, you know. But all those stories happened to somebody. And, um, and it was really, it was, it was very humbling for me, you know, because I was very different from them. A lot of them didn't speak English. You know, they, they worked in these, in these suburban houses and they were really like escondida, escondida. They were like hiding in these communities because they, some of them were undocumented. They, they just couldn't, they didn't have a lot of power, you know. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to bring them forward for people to, to see them, to see that they existed and that, that, they, that they're worthy of their stories. So... Um, yeah, so every single one, yeah. Even the ending? <laughs> yeah, even the ending. Yeah. 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 But is it mainly about you? Some um, of them? Are they mainly about you? I think, um, you know, when you're a writer, everything is about you, <laughs> in a way, because, you know, you, you're a human being, and, and so the things that you feel, and so the, if you read the same works by one writer after a while you start seeing the same themes from these people because those are your preoccupations right, right. so yeah so there's a lot of me of my, you know a lot of my preoccupations are with are with uh, with freedom and expression and fairness you know and so those kinds of things yeah I'm there you know and of course I, I have opinions you know my opinion one of the one of the chapters that I <coughs> argued with, or, or one of the sections argued, I argued with my editor about was where I was saying something along the lines of, and, you know, I wrote this book a long time ago, so I don't remember it exactly, but I say something along the lines is we, as, as mothers, we have a responsibility to raise sons who will not be violent. Right. We have to do that. That is our jobs, you know. And so my editor, who at the time was a young woman from a very privileged background who had never had children. She didn't like me saying that. And I said, I'm sorry, but that's the reality. You know, we, we are the main caretakers. So it's up to us to raise young men who are not violent. That's our jobs, you know. And we have to raise young girls to not take that stuff, you know, to know when to recognize it, to know that it's not okay, to figure out something, you know, to get out of those situations, and to know that they are right, that they're not wrong to do that, and that love does not excuse it, you know, and that was my lesson that I had to learn from my experience, where, you know, I was, I, I was with a man who was, and he was psychologically abusive, very controlling, you know, I mean, I could not go anywhere alone. If he saw me standing next to a guy, it was like the end of the world. I mean, those kinds of things you think are small things. Those are not small things over the course of years, 
and they work on you, you know. And so you, one of your jobs then, when you when you re recognize that, is how do I change that situation? How do I change that situation? You can't change that person. Right. Only they can change themselves. Right. You can't change them, <laughs> but you can change your situation, how you view it, and what you do to get out of that situation. And um, and so that was, you know, that was the, that my my thing. You know, that was that's me talking to you, <laughs> in you know, in, in this book is is trying to tell other women, you know, we have to take that responsibility on. It's part of being a mother, and we have to recognize it. Not only that, but respect it. Yeah. What about girls? Yeah, well, both. Yeah, well, you have to. You have. We have to teach our girls not to take that stuff. The violence is not right. You know what I did? My daughter, at five years old, she's in karate. <laughs> My daughter now does karate with swords. You know, she, she said that there's no, there's, you know, she, I can take a three hundred down man like. You know, because I said, I said, if, if, if emotionally, you know, I, I don't know how her growth is going to be emotionally, right? But I can prepare herself. I can prepare her to defend herself physically. I can do that, you know. And so I spent a lot of money <laughs> putting my girl in karate. I did. You know, I did not put her in ballet, which I would have liked because I like dancing. But I said, I want to protect her. I want to make sure that she has the confidence that the next time, which will happen at some point, the next person, male or female, who dares to strike her, that she knows how to stop that and make that not happen again. Um, that was my thing, you know. But we, as women, as mothers, we have other ways to do it, you know. But that was my way. Why, Why is that? Because I was scared when I was little. I was a scared kid, you know, I was, uh, in those days I was really skinny, <laughs> and I was, not a, I was not a violent person, I didn't know, I didn't know how to defend myself physically, um, but I said, I just want to make sure that at least my girl knows how to do that, um, and then I will give her all the other, kind of, the, the hypotheticals later on, yeah. Um, what about, um, I know you said about the men, not raising them to be violent, but what what kind of advice do you have for the opposite sex? And what if they're violent? It's the same thing. We try to raise non-violent people. You know, not just men, but girls. But you know, the reality in domestic violence is that it's like 90% male to female. So yeah, but I understand. I know that there are some women who are because they beat me up. You know, <laughs> I have beat up a couple of times. So I know that there is such a thing, you know, um, and and you know I, I don't I think there's there's a there's a place where it's peace and love and all that kind of stuff. But I do think that I think we have a right to defend ourselves, you know, not with guns in your house, by the way. I, I don't know, maybe whatever. <laughs> but I think I think we have a right to do that, you know. So, um, so I think girls need to know that they can do that, that they can defend themselves, from male or female, you know. So one of the messages that I got, and mine is more of a comment than a, than a question, is one of the messages that I got when I read The Turkish Lover was, and that was a situation in which Nagy was in that challenging relationship mm -hmm. and in that abuse, that it didn't matter all the sacrifices that Nagy made to make the relationship work. Right. At the end of the day, the relationship didn't work. It doesn't work. Because you can't change another person. This is like, you, you can only change you. I cannot change anyone, even your child. I hate to tell you. <laughs> you are, you're going to be the main, you're going to be the main you know, the main philosophy for that child, but that's not the only one, you know. Right. So, that, so one of the things is, and, and I remember saying, um, I know you, you have a question, but just one of, again, to my daughter that I had this, this conversation many times, more with my daughter than with my son, because I think 
he kind of got it. You know, he's four years um, older, and by the time he came along, I could see that he, he had the story. <laughs> you know what was going. But well, one of the things I used to say to her is, you know, you're going to be making choices all along the rest of your life. You're going to be. You're always going to be faced with this or that, this or that, this or that. Always. I said, and your job is to make sure that whatever the choice is, you take responsibility for. If you did it, don't say that somebody told you or, you know, because Kim Kardashian does it, you know. <laughs> I mean, that is, that's, not the, that's not you, you know. Take responsibility for your actions, your choices. And if you can do that, it's, it makes you stronger because then you realize, oh, I have, I have power over my own life. Otherwise, other people are constantly, you know, like a marioneta, you know. You don't, you don't want that. I mean, maybe you do, but I, I certainly didn't want that. And I didn't want that for my daughter or my son. Yes? Did any of your sister regret having kids so young in which they went on to college? All of my siblings, uh, all of my um, nieces and nephews who didn't go to college went into the military. So they, you know, um, so they they all found a path. Um, yeah, they found a path, and um, and I think I think it's it's been good for been good for them. You know, um, I think my sisters they never said that they regretted having kids when they were young. They they never said that. You know, um, I think once you have a child, you. It's hard to regret it, you know. My mother regretted having 11. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of kids. And now I didn't even learn that until she was in her 80s, you know, when she realized, you know, this is like, I, I, I had to work so hard for 11 kids. Kids are expensive, as you already know, even before they're born, you know how expensive they are. Kids are expensive, and so, so she had to work so, so hard for so many kids until we were old enough to help her and help our siblings and help each other. But, um, but you know, I never heard that from them. I, one sister never had children and she regrets never have, never had children at all. When it came to, you know, the menopause, she was like, oh my God, that's it. I can't do it, you know. And that was, that was a big regret for her. A question about your own youth. Did you find yourself writing things down because you have such a big um, family, mom didn't speak English, mm. or, um, throughout? Yeah, I used to write like in a journal, like a diary, you know, dear diary. My sister stole my best top and then she put a stain on it. And, you know, that I used, that's what I used to do. That's what my journals were about, were about what was going on and the things that were in some way um, having a, you know, that I was having a reaction to. Some of them are happy things, some of them are annoying things. So I always did it, but every time we moved, we would throw them all away. <laughs> so, so, but, you know. Did that, did that drive you to become, you know, the writer, <coughs> seeing the women and? Yeah, I think, that, you know, I wanted so much, when I met those women in the playground, I so much wanted people to see them as the wonderful people that they were, you know, working hard. I mean, they, they were, to me, they were very inspiring because they were, they were so much like my mother, with the one exception. My mother was an American citizen, and none of those women were. And so I knew that they, they, were, they, they were doing the same things that she had to do, but they had to do it like under the table, behind doors, you know, and they were, they, they were taking advantage of even probably worse than my mother was. Um, so I, I really wanted to, I wanted them to be seen, you know, that, that, was, that was my thing, you know, um, because I felt so invisible myself for so many years. I said, I know what that feels like, and I just, I just want their stories to be heard. So, there was a, I heard, a, I saw a hand, no? Yeah. It was about um, like how you change. Like, I have a brother. He's nineteen, and he kind of has anger issues. He doesn't know how to control it. And 
we told him like he should get help, but he had a baby. He just had a newborn baby. Like it's really he's premature, like a really small baby. And he hit his baby moms in the hospital and now they're not letting him see him. So they're telling him to take a class for anger management. He doesn't want to do it. And I want him to do it. So I don't know how. That's it really you know, the thing is you can't make people do things they don't want to make, to do, you know, and all you can do is tell him you love him, and because you love him, you want him to be a good father to that child, and you cannot be a good child, a good father to that child if you're always angry, you know, at the child's mother, at your sisters, or even, you know, because I think a lot of the time that rage comes from you know, feeling unloved and being unrecognized, you know. So that's, I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> but, but I think that that's, I would start with that, with letting him know that you, you love him and you want him to, to be, you know, to not have those issues. Because that's going to get in the way the rest of his life. It's not just in relationship, it's going to be a problem at work. You know, if you can't control your rage, no, You're gonna get fired. fired. <laughs> I don't think he could work. He don't got the. He don't. He's. My mom thinks he's always gonna be by her side. Like he's never gonna leave the house. Well, there's a problem. Yeah. Mm because -hmm. uh, there's a problem. You never tell somebody else that nobody will love you more than I do. Mm -hmm. This is what the Turk used to say to me all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody will ever love you the way I love you, and that is that is toxic. Whether it's a mother saying to a child or a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, that it's, it's toxic because it makes you feel like only that person. And then you have to forgive anything that they do. Whatever, whatever poca vergüenza, you have, to, you have to accept it because nobody else will love you like that person. That's not true. It's never true. Right. There's always somebody else. Right. And they don't have to be in an intimate relationship, you know, I am loved by many of my friends. Did I know that? No. With him, I could, didn't know that because I couldn't be with anybody else. He made sure that I had no friends. Right. Then all of a sudden, I started making friends, and I realized friends bring a lot of love into your life, right. you know, and they, and they give you advice, and they help you, and, and they, they make you laugh. You know, I have a friend who, whenever she's depressed, she says, Let's go out for a ride because all we do is laugh. You know, we just we just laugh together. You know, so so love is is not a thing with one person. It's all it's all around you if you're willing to accept it and to recognize it and to take it. You know, but that does mean that you're vulnerable to be hurt, and you have to be willing to do that. Um, did you know that this book was going to be this popular? Like you wrote it? No, I had no idea. I, when I write, when I write, I, I don't really have a sense that anybody's going to read them. You know, it's 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 weird because I'm spending you know years working on a book, but um, but I don't think that way. And so sometimes I'm really surprised. You know that um, somebody will go, yeah, somebody will mention something. Uh, sometimes some of my readers like know the books better than I do because <laughs> I, mean, I mean like I was I was earlier today at Holyoke Community College and somebody was telling me about things in when I was Puerto Rican. I wrote that book in 1992. You think I remember it as well as she did? Who just read it like two weeks ago? You know, I, I don't. I don't remember. And I'm like, really? Oh, okay, that's cool. Are you you wrote this book? No, that one was um, 95 or 6, I think. And that was before Vieques, um, before the, the Navy left. Yeah. So, so a movie was made out of this book. A movie was made a few years ago, yeah. How do you feel about the movie? Because there's some subtleties, some differences between the book and the actual movie. Yeah. Well, this is a thing when, you, when you're a writer and, and the movies come calling, the problem is that you know a film belongs to the filmmakers, and so they they can basically they they they, they buy the rights to, to to do it, and then they do whatever they want with it, and so then they can create characters that don't exist, or they can take two characters and you know mold them together, merge them. So so I had to learn to let it go, you know. 
when I write a book, I give it to you. <laughs> you know, it belongs to you at that at that stage, um, and I try not to get so attached to it that you know, because everybody's going to read something different. Also, even whatever I might write. Uh, you, you read something different because of your own experience. It's a very intimate relationship between a reader and a writer. It's, it's my words and your eyes and your brain, you know? And that is, that's, that's so personal and intimate. So, so I had to kind of just kind of step back and just encourage them to do the right thing, just make sure that, that they got it done. What part of Puerto Rico were you from? I was born in Santurce, but I grew up in Tua Baja. Yep. And, yeah. and what, um, what, that's where you grew up only? And Until I, I was 13, and then I went to Brooklyn, in New York. And then you never went back to Puerto Rico? Oh, no, I go all the time. I haven't been since the hurricane. I, I, you know, I've, it's, I ask myself every day, why don't I go there? And I'll tell you, this is, it makes me want to cry. It's because I already lost Puerto Rico once mm -hmm. when we left, when my family left. Ya me dando. La piel de gallina. So I, I lost Puerto Rico when my family took me. I didn't go, <laughs> you know, they took me. Um, and, um, and I lost it for 12 years. I didn't go back for 12 years. And then it was a very different place. And so when the hurricane um, had you know, the, the, the disaster that it was, and I, the images I was seeing, I said, I can't, I can't do it, I can't see it, I, I can't lose it again, you know. So what I'm doing is, as much as I can, I'm just making, um, raising money to send to the people to make it back the way, you know, the way it should be. Um, and and, and that, that's, you know, that's what I've been doing it, but I, I still, like, every day I want to get on a plane and go there, and in a few minutes later I'm going like, I just don't think emotionally I can take it, you know? And it's sad, but that's, that's a reality for me. I'd like to ask about the income generated from writing. How does that work for a Spanish woman that um, is single and has a couple children? Is that enough? To maintain family? No. Instead of doing <laughs> 15 jobs, I don't want to think about that. I have to work 15 jobs. You have to. You will have unless you write. You know, let's say you write a book. We'll get okay. The right publisher. Or something. Let's say that you get a publisher. <laughs> There's a lot of ifs. Okay. Yes, so you finish a book. You finish it, and it's and you you've read it 20 times and you've done the best thing that you could do. So you have this book, and then you start f trying to find an agent. Because most publishers do not read submissions that have not been read by an agent first. Why is that? It's because agents specialize. So if you're writing science fiction, and you're just sending it out to anybody, and your, your book is a romantic novel, they're not going to pay any attention to it. You know, They have en enough to work. So that's the next thing, so that's the agent. The agent then tries to send it to the agent, to the, to the publisher that the agent thinks might like that book. Um, and usually it will be two or three people, it will take many months, uh, unless this book is so brilliant that the agent goes, oh my god, I send it to so and so, give her a million dollars. You know, well, that has not happened to me. <laughs> it has not happened to anyone I know. Except for Juno Diaz. <laughs> but it just doesn't happen that often. And so most writers, the great majority of writers, either are academics, they're teaching, and then they're work, you know, they work on their um, writing either during the, the off times or off days, you know, off hours. Um, or what I'm doing, which is, you know, what, what supports my writing is public presentations because you know I'm not um, I don't want to be a teacher for other reasons that have not you know I admire and love teachers but I don't have the patience <laughs> so having been the oldest of 11 children I just don't want to be in that position again you know I just don't 
So, so I've avoided that. Um, and then my husband and I have a film company, so we work you know, together. Um, but it's very, very difficult um, to, to do it and unless you know, your book is extraordinary. There's no money. So how about, what would you say to a young man or a young lady that is into writing? That they should. These young ladies. You have to keep doing it. And has written several books. How yeah. would you recommend that they um, um, approach that? Well, so if the books are written, they have to meet? if the books are written, and they and they are the best books that they could possibly write, right? <coughs> there are ways to do it. They can do the self-publishing through like the Amazon or, or Ex Libris or just like maybe twenty different companies. The problem with that is that you're going to have to pay some money for them to publish it. So, and, and, and that's expensive. I mean, that, that looks into, the, the, we're looking at a couple of thousand dollars to get your book out there. But a lot of publishers are looking at self-published books because the books are already done. And so they do take time out to read these books to try and find the next J.K. Rowling. You know, so they're all looking for that. They are looking for the same thing you're looking for. They are looking for the big hit, the great writer who is going to make a lot of money for them. Um, and so, so that's another way to do it. A lot of writers um, do blogs. So if you do a blog and you go every day and you just do your blogs, the agents and some of the publishers have people whose job it is to go through reading these blogs and just to find stories or writers who have some promise, you know. So that's another way to do it. Um, you know, you have to get it out there, basically, but um, it's, it's, it's um, the Cinderella stories, yeah, yes. uh, it, they're very, they're rare. Yeah, they're rare. Yeah. We have time for one more question before it goes on. Oh, okay. Personally, I'd like to hear from one of the men in the audience. We're all sitting in the back of the room. I know. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> yeah, well, all the men rise. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, believe it or not. So I'm a young man who's gay, but I was homeless. I'm a city council here, so I crashed because a student invited me, so I'm not like a center, but I'm a big supporter of him. But I just want to say thank you because. Um, I'm like a third generation Boricua. I wasn't born on the island, but my partner has actually introduced me to your book. I've never read it before, but it changed my life. Um, oh, so thank you. I just want to thank you because it's through stories and your, even today you put the power of your story. Like, I think that that's what we're all trying to find with Boricuas, like here, that we're like from the diaspora here and like all these Boricuas coming. But I just want to say thank you because in our house we talk about it. That's my best friend Jessie right there. She's the one that invited me, so we can play her. Uh, but I'm really grateful that you're here in Holyoke and that you're sharing your thank story you. and that you did write your story because it gives me hope. And so, you know, coming out of homelessness, right, we teach a summer camp called Cuyo for kids ages 8 through 14. And so this summer we're actually doing your book. And so we're oh, going cool. to try to act out some of the pieces, so it'll be fun. Oh, thank um, so you. I just want to say thank you for being here. And as a man trying to check out my cheese, my wife trying to take out space for a Thank you. Any other any other questions before we go? One more question. How many times have you visited Vieques? Oh my God! We used to go every week, every every uh, winter, with when our kids were really little, especially. And so we went like maybe ten years in a row. Every winter we go to the same place, to La Casa del Frances, which then burned down some years later. So, uh, so but I haven't been there in a long time. Yeah, I guess. Uh, my but but from there. yeah, I'm sorry. My family is from. They're from Vieques. Yeah. From which which part of? Um, which? it's like it's like near like where the lanchas at. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, near Isabel Segunda. Mm -hmm. Up in there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, throughout your whole like life, your teenage life, and the whole abuse that you endured throughout um, your relationships, what was your main focus on the hope that just kept you like, oh, I can do this. I'm not the person that he says I am. I'm not the person yeah. that, you know, isn't. I think what did it was other people recognizing that I was not that that 
that girl, you know? It was people noticing it and recognizing it and, and celebrating it. Because in my job, I was like, oh my God. I mean, you know, I, I, I was 23 and I had like seven people that I was supervising, you know? But I go at home and I'm like, una nena, you know, it's ridiculous. And so I, by my work and the people that I work with and my friends that I was making in my, that I could not see outside of my job because he didn't allow it, um, I begin to understand, okay, wait a second. He's seeing something and someone entirely different. And I'm so much happier when I'm at work. <laughs> so there's something going on here. Um, and so that's, that's what kept me going is, is that, you know, when I did, when I did have, a, 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 you know, an, an outside influence from the relationship, I then understood that I was not alone, that I was much more competent than he told me I was, that I was stronger than, than he tried to make, you know. And so, so that's what did it. And, and then I was able, that doesn't mean it wasn't scary <laughs> to step away. It was, it was terrifying. But, but, I also, but I also knew I was going to be OK. You know, my mother had five husbands. Right. So, <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, all right, I don't like it. Uh, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> I knew that you could love again, but more importantly, that you could be loved again. And that's the big, that's the big thing. The right yeah. And um, like, as for your childhood, when I know it could be lonely being the oldest one out of the 11, and then, you know, with your mother having to do work and stuff, and you having to answer all those questions for yourself, how did you get through that guiding yourself? I did it by reading. I just, you know, you get a lot from literature. You, you learn a lot about life from fiction, you know. And so I read a lot of novels, and, um, and, I, and I read a lot of novels, and I realized, uh, you know, like, well, what you guys have just done. You've just read a novel about somebody, uh, many somebodies who are, who are real, you know. And and, you and your self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. So it tells you something that, that's possible for you. Um, and, and that's how I did it, because my mother couldn't do that, you know. But I did it by just going, diving into books and learning about life from books. And some of those lessons were kind of, you know, <laughs> but ma many of them, most of them, I still are part of my life. So I think we're going to do the signing right now. Thank you so much for your questions and for your attention.